This fence, um, this fence here has four bolts that line up to, to uh, this cross piece. Very easy to do. Takes just a few minutes to align it. Um, fences themselves, <coughs> design by design. And somebody might be able to answer this for me because I don't know. I've been told that the round rails are the best to go with on a fence design because they something about holding holding hold down is better and uh, allows you to uh, keep the fence straight to the rail. The square design like this here, I was told, is, uh, is not that great. But then again, these Meyer and uh, I think Unifence has that too, right? Square. Has the square. I don't know. I, you know, I might, they might be pulling my leg, but I was told that the round rails are the best. I've had very excellent results with that, and that's a Vega fence for anybody interested. They make excellent aftermarket fence. If you have a transmission saw like this, and you're using their, uh, what is it, exact fence or something? Believe me, it is not accurate. <coughs> Charlie. Yeah, the round rail has more of a grabbing, more grabbing point. That's what it was. Rather than the square. Yes, right. The round rail, as Charlie said, has uh, more surface area for you to, for your, for your cam to lock to. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. The deflection is really the problem with the fences. It's the deflection. This fence, I was shocked, is very, very good. This fence on this delta really does not deflect very much when, when in use. And I can set it anywhere along here and find that uh, it takes accurate measurements. On most of the fences that I've come across, the cheaper fences, uh, you could set your four inch, you could set your uh, gauge to four inches here, cut perfectly, set it to 17 inches here, and you're off by an eighth of an inch. You know, I can't figure out why. It might be the, the rule. photograph of the rule, or, um, which is what most people say. But you put a good one together. Best investment way. for a saw uh, is a good aftermarket fence, unless you buy a, a cabinet saw with a Unifence or a Beesmeyer, you know, one of those. If you notice that um, when when you set your fence in one spot, like I just said, four inches and it cuts fine, you set it somewhere else and it doesn't. Don't go crazy. It's just it's never going to work for you. You're going to have to compensate by knowing, you know, where, how much you, the cut difference you have, or go out and get another fence. But this fence I really, really like. You can measure from on, on something like this. Normally, on a bench top, I would always take a wooden rule, folding rule. Don't use a tape measure. Use a, full, a wooden rule. And measure from the front uh, tooth to the fence and the back tooth to the fence. Don't just trust one because you may have that, like I said, the, uh, the deflection. Uh, and it, it could be a problem. If you do, if you do right, I had this problem. If you do change the, if you do uh, move the trunnion, say you, you saw six months later, you uh, find out the trunnion moved and you have to readjust the blade to the miter slot. Go back and check your fence, your, uh, your measurements, because it could be off by 30 seconds, 64. Depends on the tolerance you want, but uh, it could make a difference. Also, here's another interesting thing. If you're using a thin curved blade, uh, and you have this set to an eighth inch, obviously it's not the same measurement, so you have to accommodate that, that uh, one thirty second, I think it is, uh, difference. And, uh, it's usually easier not to reset your gauge, but to just know that you're going to set your fence a different size. One thing I found out the hard way is when you go to sharpen your blades and put it back on, it also screws it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you have your blades sharpened, the, the grinding process could change your, your, uh, your size. Uh, I haven't really found that to be true in my case, but I've heard that. Blades. Let's talk about blades for a minute. I'm a connoisseur of blades of sorts. Uh, you all probably heard of Forest. It took me years and years before I tried one because I thought it was hype. Absolutely not hype. Daryl, you have any? Uh, uh, <laughs> Daryl, once on the website, was you know saying, "Ah, Forest, man." I'm a man. Right. Where do you get Forest? Forest blades you can get, um, I get them at the trade shows because they give you a pretty good discount. And if, here's the deal with forest. 
If anybody here wants to order order a forest blade, uh, CMR Marketing, who does the woodworking shows, offered to me to give uh, club members 15% discount on a forest blade. Uh, and if we order enough, he'll keep doing that for us. So if we get forest, if we get enough members that want to do forest blades, he'll give us 15% discount on it. A mana, mana will be, right? A rich card, yeah. Uh, that's rich card, yeah. Rich carbide, I haven't tried their blades, I have to say, so I guess I can't say I'm a kind of sword. But um, from what I understand, they're on par with, with, with the forest. I just think that par, uh, forest can give you a little more of a polished edge when you uh, when you make a cut. Sometimes that's very important for me. It minimizes the amount of time to sand an edge or having to rejoint an edge. If you get a forest blade, only let forest do it. I, I wouldn't trust my blade to anybody else. Late nice. I asked you that the other week. I just got it back uh, the other day. Beautiful, job. beautiful job. And they'll do a test cut for you, a couple of dollars more, but you're guaranteed to get a good thing. And they'll sharpen any blade. Doesn't yeah, have to be a forest. Blade. Doesn't yeah. have to be a forest 15, blade. Uh, yeah, Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. <laughs> and if you buy a blade, they give you three, three, five dollar off coupons. Yeah. You chip a tooth. If you chip a tooth, they repair it for about seven bucks. Uh, Freud makes an excellent blade too. Um, the Teflon coated, a lot of people ask, you know, is there a big difference? Yes. Honestly, I have not I have not found a big difference. But it uh, also does get the buildup on the blade. Right, the yeah. Point. Actually, that's not 100% true because... Get some. Yeah, uh, this, blade is, this blade is pretty clean, but it wasn't a while ago. And one group experience, if you have a Teflon blade, be very careful how you clean. Be very careful. When I clean blades, I only use toothbrush. And uh, there's a couple different products you can use. The most popular for me is uh, Simple Green. It really works good. Guys will use um, oven, oven cleaner, mm -hmm. which is fine. It's caustic, you know. This is, this is pretty friendly. You know, it doesn't bother my hands or my nose or anything like that. Uh, but if you're cleaning a Teflon blade, experience. Do not allow it to sit overnight in Simple Green. The next morning, you can take your fingernail, and the Teflon just sheds right off. And don't use a brass brush to clean it either. Use only a toothbrush or a soft, very soft, very soft, because it will take the Teflon right off. It will. You can see the anti-kickback part of the blade are these little hooks that come off uh, in the opposite direction of the blade. They actually act as a splitter. Um, and that is the anti-kickback design of most of these blades. Forest doesn't have an anti-kickback. That I know of. Mana does, Freud does, the wall, you know, a lot of these other manufacturers, they do. I think it does make a difference to have an anti kickback uh, design on it. But if you are using a forest blade, again, there's really no, no need for it because they cut so nicely. They really do. Uh, that's probably why they haven't incorporated that into their design. Yes, I have two thin curves here. As far as blade types, um, obviously, the smaller the tooth, uh, the smaller the tooth count on a blade, the better it would be for riveting. Okay, um, it'll bite the wood faster. You're not going to get you know, a clean, polished cut um, if you use a 20 or 24 tooth rip blade. But that's the best blade to use for ripping operation. Don't use anything more than 24 tooth if you're going to rip hard. Pine, you can you can do anything. 40 tooth, uh, 60, 80, probably. But um, a mana, to me, makes the best rip blade that I've come across. I just bought Forrest's 30 tooth thin curve uh, rip blade, and I have yet to try it. But um, I was sold on it in demonstration. Um, and I only got that because my mana needs sharpening and I need the blade. I probably would have gotten another mana. He told me that this is going to leave a fairly, uh, much twice as clean as, as a mana on the edge. Um, but it's still not going to be as polished as a 42 combination blade, which is pretty much your standard <coughs> all-purpose blade. Uh, 42. This is thin, this is uh, eighth inch. This is thin curve. No, no, there's no other difference. Just the thickness of the, of the steel. Uh, but this blade will generally do very good in ripping and cross cutting. So if you want a good all-purpose combination blade, 42. Uh, Delta makes a 36 tooth. You know, somewhere around that number is great. Right. 
if you just said use a 24 tooth blade only for ripping, right. don't go higher than that. And that's, I imagine when you're saying the cuts polish, it would mostly be in ripping operations. Worry about it, polish. Right. So, but, so do you, when do you use the 40 tooth cut for ripping? When you go, I uh, should clarify that. What I usually do is use the 20 to 24 tooth for uh, rough ripping. Okay, so if I'm ripping in a rough dimension, uh, I'll rip it first with this. And uh, it'll, it, you can rip with a 42, don't get me wrong. But I couldn't do a 700 board foot of this stuff with, with the Taurus. It didn't, it didn't even hold up after 50. Okay, the Taurus would not do it. It started burning. It started, I had to go send a shot. Put the Amana in the 22 and board that rip great. That rip really good. But um, my clarification is if you're ripping plywood, soft woods, then the 42 will do just fine. But if you're ripping hardwoods, red oak, or anything harder than that, uh, you know, you could rip cherry <coughs> and rip a 42 too, uh, and get a, you know, and get decent results. But anything, any hardwoods, you want to go to 20 or 24 to. Uh, then you got your cross cutting <coughs> blades, which are usually 60 to 80 feet. Um, this one here is, I think, these are both babies. They both look the same. This is another Freud. And Freud makes excellent, uh, might be locked. Freud makes excellent uh, cross cutting blades, uh, high tooth cap blades. They are, uh, I have two here. I have one that's called alternate devil. One tooth goes this way, one tooth goes that way, and that's it. There's no straight on this. There's, there's one that does all three, I think. It's flat and alternate. This one here is uh, ATB, uh, uh, no, uh, triple chip grind, where the blade is flat on the top, but each side of the blade is beveled. Every other two. It's flat on one and alternate, uh, and beveled on, on, on each side. You can look at it later and see. <coughs> They're um, basically, this, you want to use an alternate, uh, be, uh, triple chip grind blade for melamine and uh, plywoods that may splinter cross-cutting operations. That'll give you the best cut. Uh, and the alternate bevel will work fine for just about any cross-cutting operation, but you will get splinter, especially on the edge. What about the MDF? MDF, uh, MDF is really okay with almost any, any blade. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a lot of dust. Yeah. It's a lot of dust. Uh, any questions on blades? Yeah. Uh, if you, if right. you with the Troy T4 tooth, yeah. Could you clean it up afterwards, just take a sixteenth off, or would the blade... The blade will still leave as, as much mark as if you ripped it the first time. No, I mean, put a, uh, put a forest blade on yeah, that. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's another you know, thing uh, I might do. If I didn't want, if I had a lot of boards to run, and I didn't want to go to the joiner with these boards, and I rough ripped them, you know, from, if I ripped, say, two inch wide pieces from eight inch wide boards, a whole bunch of them, and I didn't want to go to the joiner with all of them, I'll re-rip them through with the 42 uh, forest taking a you know, 16th or 32nd off polished edge. So it saves you that time. Mike, what, what would you uh, consider a good blade for a wood that you, I mean, MDF that you would need? Veneer, I would, I would definitely, well, if, you cro um, if you're cross-cutting, then get the triple chip grind. Here's an interesting story, though. I went out and bought, spent $100 on that blade, on that triple chip grind blade, for uh, for the veneer, cross-cutting veneer, and it, it worked okay. But one day, I'm I was saying raw veneer, not we saw it. Oh, uh, raw? You mean 16th inch? Uh, yeah. Veneer. One thirty second. That's tough. Yeah. That's tough. The knife is your best. Yeah. 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 I mean, like a panel, the veneer panel, a, a panel of. Uh, That's it's already. Panel. To the, to no, I mean I would be veneer it myself on MDF. What would be a good blade? Okay, for? so if you if you veneer, you glue the veneer to yeah. the MDF. And then you want to cut it. Right. Then use either a triple chip line or a, 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 a forest would work great. I've never seen a forest went around a blue up in the air. How many teeth? 40 tooth is fine, but as high as you can go. But I can tell you, if you get a dado set, don't buy the uh, model. Somebody, who, who was I yet? Yeah, he had, uh, they're just not worth it. You know, you might as well spend, if you're going to make a lot of dado cuts, you might as well spend uh, $100 or so and get a good dado set. Um, this is a Freud, this is a super dado. It's both uh, flat bottoms 
and it probably does, not on this saw. <laughs> you have a contractor saw, most likely you'll never get flat bottoms, whether you buy Freud or you buy wood, uh, forest, ridge, doesn't matter. The arbor threads are too long. Uh, too long, I guess. And they will, uh, they will allow your, your, um, your blade to wobble, uh, to, to sit off each other a little bit based on the threads, especially threads that are worn, you know, constant on and off. Um, so that is, that is one bad point about contractor saws and probably bench saws too, is that your, uh, your arbor threads are usually going to be where you mount your, uh, your data set, and you will never get flat. That makes us to the stabilizer. This is the question. Um, whether you use a stabilizer or not. If, if, you, if you have the money, buy one. This has got to get a uh, file for the chip. Um, but these will uh, keep your blade straighter when used. It's always set to the outside of the blade. So you'll mount your blade first. Let's see. I uh, guess I'll try out this for us for you and put this on here. Um, the only, there's only one? Is that one on either side of the blade? No. It's only on one side, of, on the outside of the blade. Because so on the inside, you screw up the glory. Yeah. 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 yeah